Animals are ubiquitous in Mesoamerican art, and their relationship to humans is represented in a multitude of ways across time and space. The Olmec, for example, used animal characteristics like paws and feathers as ornaments on otherwise human figures. Members of the elite, like this figure who was possibly a ruler, are often depicted with jaguar paws adorning the front of their headdresses to imply that, like the jaguar, this person is known for their ferocity and cunning. The Mokaya, on the other hand, were an egalitarian and pre-Olmec society who blurred the line between human and animal by mixing both characteristics in the physicality of the same figure. Maybe this was because individualism was not a significant aspect of identity before social stratification. But as sensible as these interpretations may seem to us, they are still only educated guesses, even if they are born from years of dedicated research. The truth is that those of us who are not from these societies, be it as descendants or from that specific time and place, can never be certain about what is truly being communicated through this imagery. This leads to a question that is foundational to archaeological practice. How can we understand the cultural material of societies who are either gone or living but transformed by centuries worth of social-political change. My goal for this project was to interpret animal imagery in three Mesoamerican societies, the Mokaya, the early Olmec, and the classic Maya, with the concept of Nawali as a frame of reference. First, let's look at what Nawali means. Many people in Mexico and parts of Central America have heard the Nahuatl term Nahuali. Often, this evokes the image of a malevolent witch, a shapeshifter who transforms into an animal in the darkness of night to do harm unto others. In some contemporary communities in Mexico, the Nahuali is thought to be a local elderly or sick person who is out to steal the life force, or tonali, of healthy children to prolong their own lives just a little longer. But the Nawali has gotten a bad rap since the arrival of the Europeans. Though its characterization as a sinister force is now present in indigenous and non-indigenous communities alike, this is probably the result of Christian interpretation, or misinterpretation, of unfamiliar cultural and religious practices. In my thesis, I argue that using the original pre-contact definitions help eliminate Western bias in archaeological interpretation. Nawali was already a polysemic term, with two major definitions we will look at together. The first refers to one's birth sign. This is similar to the zodiac signs of Western astrology that are commonplace today, but Nawali is based on the day, not the month, of one's birth. The traditional Nawa calendar cycles through a trecena, a count between 1 and 13, as well as a tonalpowali, or a count of 20 names, often those of animals, over the course of the year. These days not only determined a person's nawali, they assigned the person a name and dictated their fortune in life, their character, their moral status, and even their profession. Someone named Xochitl, or Flower, for example, is hardworking, diligent, and destined to be an artist, maybe a painter, weaver, sculptor, or carver. The assignment of a name through the Nawa calendar also imbued the person with tonali, this is a heat force that animates all living things and is transferable to others. Because the Nawas divided a year into 18 months of 20 days each, they only had names for 360 days. There still remained five unnamed days at the end of the year called the Nomini. Without names, these days were considered separate or outside of time. Those born on the Nomini were not assigned a Nawali, nor given the boost in Tonali that comes with being named, and were completely devoid of a destiny, personality, personhood, and even a coherent physical form. People born during the unnamed days didn't even have bad luck. They were devoid of any fortune at all, and no amount of medical intervention could change their circumstance. The second definition of Nawali refers to an intrinsic connection between humans and animals. It is not so much that the person is like an animal, but that they and the animal share the essence of something. A friend explained this to me once by saying that one wouldn't say, you are fast like a rabbit, but that you and the rabbit share the essence of speed. 
So Nawali isn't something comparable to the self, but an alternate aspect of the self. This co-essential link allows humans to transform into their Nawali through the transference of Tonali, and often in one's sleep. But the transformation isn't literal, like we might imagine a person transforms into a werewolf. Rather, it is the displacement of human subjectivity to the companion entity. All this to say, formative Mesoamerica truly established concepts of transformation that have continued until today. This concept of Nawali, then, is more than just a zodiac sign or a shape-shifting witch. For centuries, it, or maybe iterations of it, have informed the process of identity-making, the construction of social hierarchies, and even who is considered a person. Animal iconographies are one of the many ways this has been communicated, but the ways in which this is done varies between societies. Working from most recent to oldest, the classic Maya, whose equivalent to Nawali is called Wai, seem to emphasize what we Westerners would perceive as human qualities within animals. In the narrative scenes of Mayan drinking vessels, animals are often anthropomorphized and participate in human activities like feasts. Even their posture is like that of a human's. Though they are depicted as social agents like their human counterparts, animals can also be used as props, even in the same scene. Animal figures in Mayan art then seem to occupy two roles at once, as Y and non-Y beings that is, animals that do or do not represent a coessence. It is seemingly only when animals are anthropomorphized and described human characteristics that they are granted agency in these scenes, but they are still often responsive to the only human figures if they are depicted together. The classic Maya and early Olmec were both socially stratified societies, so it makes sense that animals were used to communicate social inequality. Elites are thought to have hotter tonali, and therefore an association with more formidable animals, while commoners are associated with animals like ducks or rabbits who have weaker tonali. A key difference between these two societies, however, is that early Olmec art doesn't seem to make a distinction between Nawali and non-Nawali animals. While both cases may reflect a social hierarchy, Early Olmec art doesn't seem to reflect the natural hierarchy between humans and animals that classic Mayan art does. When animals and humans are depicted together, they are separate entities in juxtaposition, or, except for gods and other supernatural figures, mixed, but keeping that clear delineation between what is human and what is animal. Because social stratification allows a specific person or group to be singled out as more important than the rest, the human characteristics of elites supersede their animal coessence in representation. So while the association with their nawali is maintained, it is depicted as a removable ornament or accessory that bolsters the identity of a totally human figure. But this is completely different in the case of the Mokaya, who also use animal characteristics as ornaments, but don't hold back on mixing to make composite figures, to the point that it can be hard to tell if a figure is more one than the other. Interestingly, the head and face seem to be the only part of the body that has animal features built in, so to speak, and it just so happens that the head is where Tonali is believed to be centered and most concentrated. Ultimately, because the Mokaya case is the only one of the three that doesn't seem to prioritize or even really conserve human characteristics, I argue that animal transformation was conceptualized as more literal in this time and place at least relative to the more symbolic depictions of Nawali in early Olmec and classic Maya art. But again, as a Western scholar, my understanding of Nawali and concepts of transformation is limited. My positionality as an outsider still informs what I consider to be animal or human in this visual language. But I'm thankful for the opportunity to incorporate indigenous knowledge in my first try at archaeological practice, and for the opportunity to explore the diversity of animal imagery in Mesoamerican art. Thank you to my Nahuatl teachers, my advisor, Dr. Richard Lejour, and my mentors at LACMA for your support. And of course, thank you also to Dr. Lemelson and the Lemelson faculty for sponsoring and guiding me in my research.